Friends, we're working our way through a series on relationships. Last week we did marriage. If you weren't here, it'd be great to, uh, to go hook up and listen to it on the web. It'll help put things in context. Uh, but this morning we're going to be dealing with the subject of sex and sexuality. And it would be really helpful if we have God's help through His Holy Spirit. And also that you keep uh, the Word of God open, which was uh, very well read to us this morning. It would be particularly helpful to keep open 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and 7. I won't be referring to some, well, I will be referring to Song of Songs, but not that particular passage. Song of Songs is a beautiful uh, uh, book about the delights of a love and intimacy between a man and a woman, and ultimately actually a pale reflection of the joy and intimacy between God and his people. But let's, uh, let's pray and ask him for... His help. Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence and we are very much aware that we need your help this morning. Uh, We have your word before us and we have a difficult subject before us, but we are thankful that your word speaks truth and that your word um, brings hope and brings healing. And we do pray that that would uh, be the case this morning through the work of your Holy Spirit in our lives and that that would be for our good and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Sex, now that I've got your attention. Now, that's an old joke, but it's true, isn't it? Sex does get our attention. But for something which promises great pleasure, it's caused an enormous amount of pain, hasn't it? Sexual violence and abuse is an epidemic here in South Africa. I understand that one in three girls or women have been victims in some sort or another. That's horrific. There's also a great deal of pain for those who choose choose to have sex. The pain of living with regret or guilt, the pain of a broken heart, the pain of feeling used. And there's also the pain that's delivered on others, the pain of a broken home, almost always caused by sexual unfaithfulness. And we know that when a home falls apart, children are the broken pieces. So I want to talk this morning about sex. And I want to take a look at the ways of this world and then examine what God's Word says. And it may surprise you that God's got lots to say. And it also might surprise you what He has to say. So first, how does the world view sex? Well, for starters, it's obsessed with it. We live in a sex-crazed world. It bombards us around every corner. Songs, movies, magazines glorify sex. On the TV, I understand that by the age of 18, the average person, I think this might be in America, has seen on TV 9,000 actual or suggested acts of sexual intercourse. Well, we know the internet, their pornography is available at the click of a button. And advertising, marketing, well, we know sex sells. It sells everything from perfume to cars to ice cream. Our society is sex-crazed. Now, it wasn't always this way in Western society. Times have changed, particularly in Western civilization. Gertrude Himmelfarb, a New York-based Jewish historian, in her book, The Demoralization of Society, shows that from 1800 to 1960, 160 years, the percentage of children born outside of marriage was around 5 to 7%. From 1960 to 1995, 35 years, the figure rose to 35% gives you an indication. The graph leaps upwards from almost a flat line. In Britain in 1965, 33% of 18-year-old men and 17% of women aged 18 were no longer virgins. Twelve years later, twelve years later, in 1977, that had leapt to 69% in the men and 55% in the women. In 1994, 1% of British British men and 4% of women were virgins on their wedding day. It's clear that there's been a huge social change in behavior throughout Western society in the last 50 years. There's been an explosion of divorce, lowering the age of consent for sex, abortion's been accepted, homosexuality has been popularized. We no longer talk of spouse but partner to allow for sexual relationships in contexts other than marriage. Begs the question, why? What's behind this dramatic social change? Simple. A change of belief. We've believed a lie. Humanism and atheism, the belief that there is no God, or at least God is irrelevant, we don't have to answer to God, rather we must just be true to ourselves, 
So everything's relative. There's no absolutes. There's no transcendent being to whom we have to give an account or who tells us truth and how to live. So we're left to simply construct our own truth. We live as we see fit. And it's this that has given rise to the sexual revolution, free love, sex with whoever, whenever, however. But constructing our own truth means our sex-crazed society is also a sex-confused society, a society soaked and saturated in the lies about sex. Our society sells and promotes promiscuity and mocks and ridicules the virgin. Sigmund Freud said the repression of sexual urges wasn't only unnecessary, it was positively dangerous. Ironically, that belief is positively dangerous and has wreaked havoc on marriage, home, and society. Five years back, Oprah Winfrey was interviewing Will Smith and Jada Pinkett Smith. That's the, uh, they're the Hollywood exception, it seems, a long marriage, seemingly happy marriage. And Oprah asks them, what's the secret? Will Smith answers, we have an open marriage. An open marriage is where the couple aren't sexually exclusive. They're free to have sex with others. It's as if our society is naked and has no shame. And what you and I are both being told, both subtly and blatantly, by society around us, by almost every magazine you read, song you hear, movie you watch, can be simply captured by the slogan, if it feels good, do it. Although in our day, because of the threat for AIDS, it's been qualified. If it feels good, do it safely. An educational leaflet at a British university had as its tagline, sleep with whoever you can, whenever you can, but do it safely. Just use a condom. Now, in this thinking, sex is little more than a bodily appetite. Feeling hungry? Have a burger. Feeling thirsty? Have a Coke. Feeling turned on? Have sex. The other person is almost incidental. It's life without limits, without moral limits, that is. Mike Starkey, a shrewd commentator of modern Western society, writes, Most of my contemporaries no longer make love. They shag, bonk, screw, quickly, anonymously, lovelessly. The generation, our generation, more pitifully seeking for intimacy than any other in history, has taken the central sacrament of interpersonal intimacy and killed it dead. Now, friends, brothers, sisters, we must remember that this is the wallpaper of our society. It's the air we breathe. The influence of our society, the media, the music, the magazines, is massive. And because of the lies about sex, it's very difficult for us to think straight about sex and sexuality. It's easy just to be swept along with public opinion or public oppression. Now, we've looked at the ways of the world. Let's now look at the word of God, which, and this may surprise some, has a lot to say about sex. The Bible teaches how a man and a woman ought to relate sexually, and it does so in detail, often using picturesque and exuberant language. God's view of sex in the Bible is both liberating and confronting. Liberating as we understand how God has made us. Confronting as we discover how short we fall. And so for the rest of this talk, I'm going to list and affirm several biblical truths. First, God is for sex. God is very much in favor of sex. It is his good gift. Sex is God's good gift. Um, It wasn't like Adam and Eve discovered sex and then said to one another, let's not tell God, he might get really annoyed. No, sex is God's idea. He designed sex and he designed us to be able to have sex. So the forbidden fruit in the garden isn't sex. Sex is God's good gift. And like all of God's gifts, is to be received with gratitude and understood and used according to his instructions. Which will mean we may need to adjust the importance we attach to sex. We must affirm that sex is important, which may mean you must elevate your view of sex. When sex is used to sell ice creams and cars and perfumes and all the other things, It's clearly devalued. Sex has lost its specialness, its dignity, its exclusivity. But it's not just society that devalues sex. Pain of sexual sin 
sexual abuse, failed sexual relationships, experimentation with pornography, all this may cause you to devalue sex. And sexual sins have powerful psychological effects on those who commit them and those who are the victims. It can take years for such a person to reconstruct their view of sex, to work through their experience, and to untangle their thinking from it. On the other hand, though, you may need to lower your view of sex. Sex is not the be-all and end-all of a relationship. It's not about your own self-fulfillment. Yes, it must be carried out in such a way as to please God. But God is not rating our sexual performance. And what's more, sex is not some kind of mystical experience that is a physical path to a higher spiritual plane. No. Being one with each other does not also mean being at one with the cosmos. Sex is not a god or goddess. We mustn't buy the lie. The religion of sex is not our saviour. Sex is important, but it's not that important. We must adjust our view. Sex is simply God's good gift, but it's a good gift for, and listen to this, for this life. In the life to come, there won't be human marriage. We saw that last week, as Jesus points out in Mark 12, will be like the angel, neither given nor taken in marriage. But be sure to know that we won't miss it, because in heaven there's going to be no want. We'll be perfectly happy, lacking nothing. In fact, sex in marriage, intimacy in marriage, is only a taste, a, a pale reflection, a small picture of the intimacy that we're going to enjoy with God and all of his people. So we must be realistic about sex. It's important, but not too important. It's a good gift for a married couple in this life, but not more than that. Sex is God's idea. It's his gift to be received thankfully and obediently to be used as God designed according to his instructions. Now, when I was 16, I remember my pastor at the time, he was a much older man, saying, and with a big smile on his face to about, bunch of about 50 teens, he stretched out his hands and said, I believe in maximum sex. But then he added, but we can only enjoy God's gift of sex to the maximum within marriage. God has designed sex for marriage. And be sure to know that God knows what's best for us. He's not a killjoy. He wants us to enjoy sex within marriage, not before not outside of. And as we saw last week, God's blueprint for marriage is found at the end of Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, where we're told that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Leave, cleave, and become one flesh. Now that formula is repeated in Ephesians chapter 5. And notice what it emphasizes. That marriage is between one man and one woman, a man and a woman. They leave, they cleave, and they become one flesh. Which brings me to my next point, because I want you to notice the order. Commitment comes first, sex comes last. The word for cleave or united speaks of a covenant, an unbreakable bond, a promise. We've all got two types of relationships. We've got consumer relationships and we've got covenant relationships. Consumer relationships are like our relationships with our cell phone provider, our health insurance, or the supermarket where you do your grocery shopping. It's business. You look for the best deal, you pay, they provide. Uh, I've been with Vodacom, Celsi, Virgin, and now I'm back with Vodacom. There's not much loyalty attached to consumer relationships. Covenant relationships, though, are based on a promise. They're binding, they're permanent. And sadly, this world sells the lie that we can turn what ought to be a covenant relationship into a consumer one. We try before we buy. We sit loose with sexual relationships. Our loyalty is low, and then we end with a guilty hangover and lasting consequences. The very word used in the Old Testament in the Hebrew language for sex is translated as no. Adam knew his wife. It's all the way through Genesis in the Old Testament. No, no, knew, knew. That word is the same word used for glue. That's what it literally means. It bonds people together. 
You see, when you get married, you make a covenant. You make a public promise to love someone for life. You make a public promise to love someone for life. That's a covenant. And it's in the context of that covenant, marriage covenant, that sex is designed for. That's its rightful place. That's the place where we will truly enjoy it and we will enjoy it to the maximum. Well, furthermore, the world tells us that the basis of marriage is love. That's what the world tells us. Love is the basis of marriage. It's wrong. If we believe that, we'll go the same route as so many Hollywood marriages. You fall in love, you get married, then someone along the line, you fall out of love, and you get divorced. Let's be honest. Married couples are not always in love, but we ought to love each other. We won't always have the butterflies and the ooey-gooey, mushy romantic feelings, but we ought always to love each other. Why? Because the base of marriage is not love, but faithfulness. See, what keeps a married couple together is not love, but their word. They keep their promise. They're faithful. Now, within faithfulness, love usually blossoms and grows. But love is the trailer hitched to the vehicle of faithfulness, not the other way around. That's the base of marriage. What about the purpose of marriage? Well, the world will tell you that its purpose is happiness, self-fulfillment. That's wrong. Because it's not about you. The purpose of marriage is service. Serving your spouse and serving God. Now within service, happiness usually blossoms and grows. It's a common byproduct. If we want a loving and happy marriage, we must first and foremost have a faithful and serving marriage. Think about it. Sex outside of a faithful relationship, even when love is present, is plain with fire. You will get burnt. But sex within a faithful covenant relationship and sex with a service attitude frees one up to be uninhibited, honest, pleasurable, and fun. Sex outside of the marriage covenant, you're playing with fire. You're playing in the fire. So be warned. And with that, I'm turning to the final point that we're going to look at this morning. Be warned, because committers of sexual sin, sexual offenders, are in grave danger. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, read for us by Shadri, reveals God's attitude to sexual sin, or any sin for that matter. Verse 9, we're told there, wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. The point here is that everyone who continues to live in sin, sexual or otherwise, will be excluded from God's kingdom. This is anyone who is defined by their sin. Now, I guess there'll be two possible reactions to what I've just read and said. On the one hand... You may be riddled with guilt and despair. On the other, you may be untroubled, thinking, that's not me. If you think that's not me, don't be too quick to get all high and mighty and self-righteous. Jesus makes it very clear that everyone is a sexual offender. You shocked? Well, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is teaching, and he says, you think you didn't murder? Well, have you been angry with someone in your heart? You killed them. And then he says, you think you haven't committed adultery? Then verse 28 he says, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. The whole point of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthews 5 to 7 is to show all of us that we're actually all unclean. We're sinful we may not have sexually sinned with our bodies, but we've all sinned with our minds in our hearts. Everyone. So if you're thinking that's not me, think again. And now you've probably got the other reaction, guilt and despair. So now I want to say to those who are weighed down by guilt, who battle with it, who are wounded by it, hear this. Jesus offers forgiveness. 
God forgives sexual offenders. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and now verse 11, where Paul writes, and that is what some of you were. He said, these guys won't inherit the kingdom of God, but that is what some of you were. Past tense. You're not defined by that anymore. He says, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You were washed, cleansed, forgiven. You were sanctified, made pure and holy. You were justified, declared legally righteous, innocent, not guilty. How's that possible? It says all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's through Jesus. His death on our behalf, punished for our sin in our place. Jesus took your sin so that you could be clothed in his purity. No matter what you've done, if Jesus died for you, your sins are washed away. And you are as sexually pure as Jesus is. Because when the Father looks at you, he sees his son. There's a story of a Brazilian girl from a small rural town who as a young teen uh, ran away from home to the bright lights of the big city. Her mother ran after her, searching everywhere. The young girl soon fell onto hard times and ended up on the street and started to sell her body. She walked the streets as a prostitute. Her mother had feared this because that was the normal outcome. The mom searched aimlessly, and sadly she gave up. But before returning home, she printed hundreds of posters with her daughter's face on. She plastered them on walls wherever she could. A couple of months later, her young daughter, who had hit rock bottom, came across a poster in a train station. There she saw her face, and then she read these words on the poster. Her mother had written, Wherever you are, whatever you've done, I love you, I forgive you. Please come home. And she did. Forgiveness is offered in Jesus Christ to each and every one of us. He embraces us and he puts it behind him. When God forgives, he does forget. Now, if you're forgiven, you're in God's family and he wants you to live like it. God's grace isn't cheap. Rather, God's grace changes us, transforms us. So if you're forgiven, listen up to what God now says about your body. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, this time verse 13, which says, The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. Your body is under new ownership. Your body is God's property. It's for the Lord to be used in his service, used as God designed. Just drop your eyes further down to verse 19, which says, Your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. Now when you shop for a t-shirt, you look through the, the various things and you flip over the tag at the back to see how much it is and where it was made. Well, there's a tag attached to you. Flip it over and it reads, The property of God, made in heaven. You are his real estate. Indwelt by the Holy Spirit, God owns you. But now just turn that tag over to see the price. And you'll realize you didn't come cheap. You were bought at great cost. The price tag reads, The death of God's only son. Verse 20. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. And honoring God with your body sexually will mean different things for different people depending on their circumstances. And chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians unpacks all that. And just briefly, I'll mention that if you're single, it says in verses 1 and 2 and verse 8, it's good to remain single. But it's also good to get married. Either is good if you're single. On the other hand, if you're single and you're sinning sexually, verses 8 and 9, that is you're not able to control your bodies, you're burning with passion. And burning with passion doesn't mean just desire. It means that actually you're uncontrolling yourself if you look at the context. Well, God says then, do one of two things. Stop or get married. And if you're married, God's advice in verses 3 to 5 is enjoy intimacy 
enjoy sex with your spouse. He says, don't deprive each other. And if you do, it's got to be agreement by both of you, and only for a short period of time, and only for the purpose of prayer. And then when that's over, come together again quickly, he says. And then, what about temptation? We live in a world that is sex-crazed. Temptation is everywhere. Uh, It's a battle, and we need some tactics. What tactics? Well, whether you're single or married, what can you do to remain pure and avoid sexual immorality? Well, God's got one word of advice for all of us. One word of advice. And it's a short four-letter word in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. And it reads, flee. Flee from sexual immorality. I call it the, the techie. The techies tactic. When faced with temptation, put your techies on and run fast in the opposite direction. Well, what will that mean? Well, for the single person, this will mean not having sex. For the married person, this will mean having sex with your marriage partner. Sex without marriage is wrong, and marriage without sex is wrong. Now, we know that desire may diminish with age or illness or unforeseen circumstances, but one should always enjoy and cherish intimacy with your spouse. Friends, when it comes to temptation, we trust ourselves far too much. We ought to be practical about putting uh, things in place to protect us and others. Perhaps being accountable to somebody else that you know. Perhaps being careful uh, when and how you on the uh, computer or the internet or when you watch TV or who you watch it with. I remember a Bible college principal who I lived with for a couple of weeks in Australia uh, many years back before I got married. And um, we were watching TV together late, just him and I. And I said, oh, I'm going to go off to bed. And he said, oh, if you're going, I'm going. Because I don't watch TV late at night on my own. I thought, there, there's a Bible college principal. You know, someone I would expect to be godly. You know what? He was godly because he took practical precautions to protect him and his wife and family. Friends, in closing, in all of this, we must remember that human marriage, as we learned last week, is merely a picture of a much greater reality, and that is the marriage between Jesus Christ and his church. And as such, sex is merely a picture of intimacy, intimacy and delight between God and his people which all of us who are redeemed will enjoy in heaven because we'll all be married to Christ. Hooray for Jesus. In him we have forgiveness and in him we can live out our lives and our sexuality in a way which is good for us and others and good for his glory. Amen.